Chris, welcome to the Your Digital Marketing Coach Podcast, my friend. Hey, Neil. Pumped to be here. You know, I often have difficulties pronouncing guest names, but Chris <laughs> Smith is not a name I'm going to go wrong with, hopefully. Yeah, that was easier than Dial. Uh, what was your last guest name? I, Minter Dial? Oh, Minter Dial. Oh, and I man. literally had to ask him, like, mm -hmm. what's the story behind your last name? No, no, it's it's an actual last name. So Yeah, I'm always, you know how everybody's jealous of what they don't have. For me, I don't have a cool name, so I have name envy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, my friend. So uh, you are the author of The Conversion Code, national bestseller, published with Wiley, already on your second edition. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I look at the blurbs on the back and immediately, if you need more traffic leads and sales, you need the conversion code from Neil, the other Neil, the much mm -hmm. more famous Neil <laughs> who spells Neil wrong with an I instead of an A, but Neil Patel. Mm -hmm. So obviously, um, you've, you've had a lot of success and we'll go into the book and some of the takeaways for the audience vis-a-vis -vis digital marketing and what have you, but mm -hmm. let's take sort of a step back. Chris Smith, you, as before we hit the record button, you're like, I've worked with like billion billionaire bosses. And mm -hmm. so I guess, you know, who is, who is Chris Smith? What, what, what brought you into this world of the digital marketing that you, you wrote about in this book? Yeah, I think probably what would be unique and interesting about my journey into digital marketing is that it started in the boiler room doing phone sales for telemarketing companies that were basically doing fraud. I mean, I came from the real boiler room, the Wolf of Wall Street stuff. My first boss was named Lou Perlman. He discovered NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears. I live here in Orlando. Well, when you work in a boiler room and the, the scripts and the coaching and the sales part of it is so good. I mean, world-class, Neil. Then all you need is good leads and, you're, and then that's it. It's two things, right? So world-class sales, great leads. And companies just don't have both. It's unbelievable. I've been waiting for a company to do as good of a job at both as my first company I ever worked for. And no one has because it is hard to get high quality leads and it is hard to get them to convert over the phone on one call. And so when I got into marketing, I mean, the way I got into marketing was I was in sales and I just started recording my sales pitches and a great salesperson teaches, they don't pitch. So I would do a class you know, 95% training. Hey, now that you guys enjoyed it, now that I've helped your business, can you help my business? Give me five minutes to talk to you about the products that we sell. And I was teaching, my company was yelling at me, Neil, because all of my classes were classes. They weren't sales pitches because they'd book them different on the calendar. And so I knew the best way to sell face-to-face, in-person, belly-to-belly selling software was to be there have a great call, close them that day, but I had to keep in touch. And, I mean, I did it for selfish reasons. I got into marketing so that the people that bought my stuff wouldn't quit. Mm. I had to optimize, Neil, a 30-day campaign because if they canceled, they took my commission away. So if the person didn't keep it until day 31, I'm gone. So that forced me to do service and marketing to keep in touch with people and bring value to bridge that gap. That was why I started. That makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, something I don't think I've ever mentioned in this podcast, but when I was a high schooler, I took a part-time job, part job in a trailer, going mm -hmm. through the phone book, calling up people, asking them if they need a remodel of their home. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I know um, what a brutal world that is and you, the turnover in that trailer, as you can imagine. And even the people that were successful, I don't even know if they was, were legitimate leads or not. It was just mm -hmm. people saying, oh, these people said, yes, here are the phone numbers. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a whole uh, story for another time. That's right. But uh, that's very interesting how sales brought you into marketing. I mm -hmm. Similarly, my background B2B sales, I often found that there was a story that needed to be told mm -hmm. about the company, about the products to further get people interested in hearing what we had to say. But I love that teaching. You were almost doing content marketing before content marketing because the classes were, yeah. that, that was the content, right? And the marketing. So, mm -hmm. so. Fast forward, you did you end up working at uh, a lot of companies and then become a consultant or what sort of, because your book is obviously built upon a lot of experiences. What, yeah. where did you accumulate those over time? Yeah, I'm always happy to pay it forward. And you know, I've learned a lot from a lot of people and I'm lucky now that I'm teaching, but a lot of what I'm teaching is what I learned. I mean, you've been in doing what you're doing a long time, just like me. Not every lesson sticks. 
So if you have a career that's 20 years, 30 years, and you've had amazing coaches at world-class companies, the stuff you don't forget is the stuff you should teach because you learned so much that you forgot. So those nuggets, those isms, those phrases, those drawings, right? That, that's just how I learn. And so the book I would say is, you know, half, Hey, here's what I learned from all these amazing people. And then here's what I learned doing it for myself and my clients and my company. So I got, I started getting headhunted by, you know, software companies and media companies and publicly traded companies. They all wanted me to come work for them because I was great at social media and they weren't, they needed help. And I was the most influential person in real estate, the number one blog in real estate, the most followers, everything in the real early days. Mm -hmm. And so when that started happening, my phone's ringing. The Wall Street Journal called me, Neil, in 2010 and said, can we give you $5,000 a month to advertise on your blog? Holy. And I was like, who is this? <laughs> I'm like, who are you? Is this Johnny? You know, is this a joke? And it wasn't because I had an audience that was niche that loved me. And so the wall street journal sells ads for listings, but they don't want to sell the ads for listings to every agent, just the best ones because they're expensive. So you could go advertise on a lot of places, but if you advertised on tech savvy agent, that was my blog, you knew exactly who you were reaching. And I'm a sales guy. I present the stuff I'm excited about as if it's mine. I'm up here selling that you try this app. I'm over here selling Figma. I'm over here selling Slack. I'm selling Upwork. You know what I mean? I sell everything that I love. And yeah, I own stuff and my I love my book. It's great. I think my classes are amazing. So when you have that belief in what you're selling, it's easy to get pumped about it. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a fun journey and it's been an interesting journey. And I love what you said there, Neil, about content marketing before it was content marketing. Content marketing before it was content marketing was a very simple idea. Listen more than you speak so that you know what to say back through the lens that will be interesting to the person hearing it. You know, I, I think, you know, Phil M. Jones, he, he's one of my buddies. I wrote a book with him, co-authored exactly what to say for real estate agents off the back of his main title. And it, it is amazing how bad people are at just basic conversations. You know, when they learn what's in that book, which is honestly, it is so simple. It's like three words, like, what makes you say that? <laughs> like, I know, you know, in my book, I'm making fun of it. It's that simple. But the, the key is that, and, and there's a story about this that I'm going to butcher, but there, this guy like takes someone out and the whole time he asks some questions, and then the other guy he takes out and the whole time he talks to him about himself and the guy that he asked all the questions to came back and was like, Oh my God, I love this guy. He's amazing. He's the best guy I've ever wanted to work for. He's awesome. And the other guy's like, yeah, he's pretty good. Meanwhile, it's because he was asking questions. He was putting the mirror back on them. So the issue is most people, Neil, are not genuinely curious. Most people don't actually care if the lead magnet is more valuable than my email. So the people that do are doing really good. Yeah, um, well said. And, uh, you know, just going back to those B2B sales days, you mm -hmm. know, we were trained in solution selling and you basically your customers are telling you what they need. Mm -hmm. You just need to ask the right questions, listen, and then propose something for what they were asking. Mm -hmm. And on a simplistic basis, yes, I mean, there's obviously more to it than just that, but I'm curious. So all of these things led you to real estate, I'm assuming, which led you to social media. Mm -hmm. So what was it? And I know we're going back in history here, but mm -hmm. there are some, there's still some of uh, people that listen to this that aren't maybe not active, like, well, I don't see, I don't see why TikTok's important today mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever social network. So I'm curious as to what brought you to become that passionate about blogging or when you said you were on social media, what, what brought you into that world in the early days? Yeah. So the, well, dopamine, Neil, <laughs> Be, because when you're good at it and you put out great content and you got get a lot of feedback, it's great. It's amazing. Like people don't want to be writers. They want readers. Hmm. So I wanted readers. I wanted viewers. I wanted fans and social media gave that to me right out of the gates. 
And so from day one, I've loved it. And I've loved it because I've also from day one, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I'm driving home from a long day of selling software. I had the whole state of Florida. So I was driving a ton. So I'm driving home long day, 14, 15 hour day. And we had a, my boss, Max Pigman, he was a VP at realtor.com. He said, Hey, we're going to do a quick training. I want to show you guys something they just showed me. Cause you know, the, these guys have ad agencies and you know, these billion dollar companies have CMOs and stuff. Right. Yep. So he's like, Hey, pull over. So we, everybody just stopped with their door. We kind of did a WebEx. <laughs> I don't think that's around anymore, but we did a WebEx and he said, watch this. And he was showing us how Facebook ads worked and he showed us the targeting. And it didn't take me more than 30 seconds to be like, oh, okay. I went straight home and I set up an ad. And I said, does Keller Williams or Coldwell Banker have more agents in my community? Find out here. And then I did another one. And I said, is Trulia or Zillow going to acquire tech savvy agent first? Very and I cool. targeted at those companies. Yeah. And Neil, no lie, less than one week, the CEO of Zillow, dude, what's up here? What are you doing? <laughs> because everybody in the office was showing them the ad. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm good. So I, what happens for me, Neil, is I don't need a mound of evidence like a lot of people do in your world. I just need a slice of evidence plus my instincts. And then I just go full speed ahead. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Um, that those are great stories. And it, it's still funny because we can still use social media ads in the targeting capabilities have changed over time, but mm -hmm. you can still go on a fit and use it as a way to experiment and generate word of mouth or, or action. Like you just did there, even today, mm -hmm. that's still yeah. a lot of companies. Haven't taken well, I heard somebody, uh, her name is Jamie. She's with a group called girls with grit. I want to give her the props here, but she said, you're, you should be, you should just try to be five mile famous because if your goal is to be five mile famous, it's actually not that daunting. Like if I told you, you know, Neil, I need you to become the most famous person within five miles of my house. You could do it. It probably wouldn't even take that long. Put up some billboards. Like I can tell you Rocco English is probably the most famous dude around here. Why? He's on all the State Farm billboards. He's on all the yeah. park benches. You know what I'm saying? It ain't that hard to get famous in a five mile radius. You just have to find your five miles on the internet. And, it, and people are just trying to go too big is my, is my guess. In most cases, they're trying to go after the whole internet. Mm. Food for thought. All right. On, on that food for thought, I want to jump into the conversion code because, mm -hmm. you know, second edition and the, uh, the volume, you know, we have, obviously it's built down into sections, but there's, you know, there's a few dozen chapters here and it really covers from what I can see the entire scope mm -hmm. of digital content, social media marketing. Um, mm -hmm. but let's first start when I asked you, you know, wh what did you want to talk about today? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about stop chasing leads, start attracting clients. Mm -hmm. You mentioned digital marketing as like the first one. Mm -hmm. So it it's funny. I recently had another marketing author on and he says, Neil, the funny thing is that most of my clients, they're still, they still don't have the digital marketing fundamentals mm -hmm. down, right. And mm -hmm. all of my consulting seems to be spent on that. Yeah. So I'm curious if you're seeing the same thing in the market. I am definitely since COVID, I'm, I'm seeing something very similar where, you know, I wrote a book on influencer marketing companies reach out to me for that, but it's like, wait, we don't have the fundamentals down yet. Mm -hmm. Let's get our house in order first and get that working. Then everything else is going to be more effective. So I'm yeah. curious as to what your, what your angle is on all this. Well, it's funny you say that. Cause in the, in the book, I use the analogy that if you even had company over tonight, you'd clean your house rigorously, but people are inviting company to their website all day, every day, and they don't straighten it up first. And that's exactly your point. I can go hire Logan Paul or Bella Porch or one of these people to pimp my stuff. But if the landing page is broken and the autoresponder sucks and the sales team takes too long to call, I wait, I just back to wasting my money again. Or you don't even have a funnel, which I no. So I, that's, you know, when you say I cover everything I do, but in order, you know, you said you're a processes person. What I did is I said, okay, I'm meeting way too many people that are bad at all of it or not doing any of it or barely doing any of it. So let me start over. Let me take a step back and figure out what do I have in place that other people need and, and what is the proper order to deploy that? So I am a little old school. Call me old school. I start with the website and then I go to the landing pages and then I go to the lead magnets 
And then I go to blogging and then I go to Facebook, Instagram, right? So I'm covering all of it because I've done all of it. The, the only thing I write about is stuff that I've done for myself or I've seen done for my customers, but it's, it's sort of like what Brene Brown calls me search. I'm doing me search every day. Mm. And then I take the me search that seems really relevant. And I say, Hey, Jimmy, go see if this will work for our 600 agency clients. I think this, I think this me search might be they search too. And oh my God, Neil, it works sometimes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm the lab. That's yeah. how I think of it. My personal brand is the lab. And then the, the call it experiments that do well. I then develop a hypothesis that they'll do well for others. And then I have scale, which is great because I have a huge email list and I have a ton of followers and I have a ton of clients and fans and all this stuff. So I'm able to, I mean, it is so gratifying. Like I was teaching a class yesterday and the guy asked a question about vertical videos and he was asking about, you know, how to structure the video. Cause so many people that are doing vertical videos to your point, they're kind of new. And it's like, Hey, this is Neil. I wanted to welcome you today to our TikTok channel. You know, what we're going to talk about today with IBM is we're going to talk about the advances that we've made in Watson. And you know, Neil, you're laughing because I'm six TikToks past you and you're still talking. Does that make <laughs> sense? So that, that like the science of this stuff is so fascinating to me because I've had people comment on my book on Amazon. Oh, you're just charismatic. You can, it's just you bullshit. That is, that is so false because I've worked with and coached thousands of salespeople. I've seen salespeople that are terrible become really good. And I've seen salespeople that are average become great. And it was just because they executed the X and O's they were learning. That was it. So it's very practical. You know, Wiley probably hates the book because no one can explain it. What's the conversion code? Oh, it's everything. That's not good for marketing. You know that, Neil. But the reality is someone needed to write a book about all of it. And I felt like I deserve to be able to do that because of how much experience I have on the sales side. And so I wrote maybe one of the only books, I'd, I'd love you to research it, on marketing and sales. And I think that's crazy that there's one. And I also think it's crazy that marketing sales and tech are companies haven't figured that out that they're, they're so dependent and reliant upon each other so you said earlier what the book's based on but it's literally marketing tech sales because once you have all the marketing cooking well now i got to do lead routing and lead scoring and drip campaigns and sms there's a lot of tech i got to use it i don't really care if it's tech but i have to use systems and technology to scale my ability to go from MQL to SQL. No, amen, brother. I, I'm the exact same way. And that's why everybody listening, you should be doing the exact same thing. If you have a personal brand, that is your mm -hmm. playground to yeah. experiment with, right? And if you work at a company, that mm -hmm. is also your playground to come up mm -hmm. with these hypotheses, create your own processes that then you could take anywhere. So I, you know, I agree hundred percent. I'm, I'm a kind, I'm a similar spirit. I work on a smaller scale, but yeah, I only write about things that I experiment with. And, and that's why my, my new book has taken a few years because I need more data of replicating this with clients, proving it out. But, but amen, brother. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about sales and marketing alignment. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's there, right. And the technology is the glue mm -hmm. that also, by the way, helps you scale. So Everything yep. you and say there's makes... no red tape when it's just your, your stuff. Yeah, of course. I don't need to call anyone to see if I'm allowed to do it. I don't have to yeah. meeting, get sign off and buy in and look at it from 360 degrees about how everyone else will think about it. Like, and here's what happens in the real world when you can move fast. I see a tweet that said, if, if famous companies, websites, headlines were honest, I saw that tweet. It was great. Can't even remember the guy that did it. It was like Netflix, Apple's, all these huge brands. So I said, oh, I'm going to do that for real estate. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to take the headlines off Zillow and I'm going to take the headline off Redfin. I'm going to take the headline off realtor.com and I'm going to put my own headlines because I know the industry. And so I knew what would land with agents. So for realtor.com, I took off the headline and I put like Zillow, but for boomers. The, for Trulia, I put 
we're surprised we're still here too. They're still there. For Zillow, I said, we didn't get rid of realtors, but we got really rich trying to. And then for Redfin, I said, people love using our app, using our agents, not so much. Okay. If I do that campaign as my company, I'm in a lawsuit probably pretty quickly, but because it's just me and Glenn, the CEO of Redfin, and we had a little spat on Twitter. And next thing you know, it's getting written up in the news that he can't take a joke. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because it's clearly a joke. It's clearly parody. So, right. so it's, it's sort of the gift and the curse to be able to move that fast. Yeah. And that's, that's something definitely the larger the company, the harder, and mm -hmm. probably a lot of you are nodding your heads. But on the other hand, if you are a personal brand, a content creator, an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, there's no excuse not to. Well, look, can I address the people fast. at the companies that think it's impossible? Why, why can't they carve out a SEAL team? Well, like, why can't you silo experiments it, it, it's really not that hard yeah. like you have to have r d that's just social media you know and so anyway i i think i understand how hard it is to have a pretty big company not as big as these guys that you work with but i got 60 employees you know we do over a million a month in revenue that recurs like we're big boys yeah it's hard so I understand the challenges of being a huge company. Like I actually almost got fired, Neil, when I started my blog, because guess what was against the company policy? Uh, Can't put out content that's not approved by us because we're publicly traded. Hmm. I just didn't care. I, I just knew what I was doing was the right thing to do. And you know who else knew? My boss. So if you're that executive that knows that there's people in your company that need to be put into a Pope mobile so that they're untouchable, do it. And I have talked to some people that work at very large enterprises that are in that position. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it is possible. And it really comes down to that relationship with, with that, that executive, that boss that understands that. So, so well yeah, said. one of them wanted to fire me. One of them wanted to promote me. Yeah. Thankfully the one that wanted to promote me was my direct report. <laughs> the one that wanted to fire me was his boss. So I had that layer of insulation. Yeah. Good reminder. So I want to get back to the book. So mm -hmm. we talked about the digital marketing. One of the other things you talked about was lead follow-up. So mm -hmm. the fundamental is you, you have a funnel, you have a way of actually generating leads, you mm -hmm. know, once you have your house in order. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you go uh, into that and how to do that in the book as well. But once we get those leads, what is it that we need to know about the lead follow-up that you've seen? Well, it's, it's so smart of you to point out that people don't have the lead generation part figured out Wiley forced me to write section one, Neil. I, I wanted to write a book called Inside Sales. That was the proposal. Oh, really? Yeah, Inside Sales, which was going to be a double meaning, right? Like inside the boil room, here's the dirty secrets. And then inside sales, here's how to do it real good. They said, Chris, people don't need a book about following up with leads. They don't have any leads. <laughs> so no one's going to read it. I was like, okay, I, I got you. So part two, which is now we have the leads coming in. Th this is probably the thing that you can finagle the quickest to get results, Neil. Because as an example, I'm listening to this and let's say I don't have an autoresponder text message when leads that come in have a phone number with them. Let's just say hypothetically that there's companies out there that would fit that description. Just doing that can turn the knob even more than marketing getting better or sales getting better because that's happening every day. Like you said, that's why you want the house to be clean, you know, get rid of the friction. Uh, and so then another one would be how quickly are people calling? You know, every second counts. You should see the difference between minute one and minute two and minute three, the difference between minute five and minute 30, the difference between day one and day seven time kills conversion. And so that's another thing a lot of companies have not put in place. They do not have speed to lead dialed in. Another very small one is people don't answer the phone when you call them. And so I don't want to have to do things that are annoying, but because there's so many robo dials and political voicemail stealth robo drops, I don't know what they're called, but I know there's 4 billion robo calls a month. And so because of that, 
even if the person wanted me to call them, they're going to ignore that first call because they don't know the number. So when that happens, I don't get mad. I call again right away and they pick up half the time. I call it the double dial. Those are little tactical changes. Another one, honestly, Neil, combine the ideas, merge codes. People still don't even use merge codes right. You get a lead. Let's go down that path of the text message. It doesn't have to say, hey, why'd you reach out to us? It can say, hey, Neil, how's your day going? This is Chris from Salesforce. So personalization, simple. You know, automation, following up with leads, just focus on the first text. People, people they try to eat the whole elephant. You know that. I, I think there's little things in the follow-up component of this whole puzzle that are your quickest path to moving the numbers like lead conversion rate, cost per lead, ROI. Th those numbers go up quicker, sometimes through just the wires under the hood, getting kind of stripped away and put back together in the right circuit. And what you're talking about is something that no one talks about. That we talk about the customer journey. What happens after the lead? What, what does that follow-up look like, right? Mm -hmm. Do you even get someone on the phone? I think for all the digital talk we talk mm -hmm. about, there's nothing more valuable than getting someone on the phone yes. uh, to be able to, or, or a video like this, to be able to speak with them, to, to mm -hmm. understand their body language, what have you. So uh, well said. And, and just adding the text part, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many companies that don't, that just focus on the email, not realizing that text marketing converts at a, um, as I'm sure you know, a crazy high rate right. once you have it dialed in. Mm -hmm. So really, really great advice. Wherever you are on that journey, um, it does not stop at the lead, needless mm -hmm. to say. Um, well, here's a quick stat. 95% of leads take more than 30 days to close. So if you've got it all front loaded, but there's nothing back loaded, again, that can crank up the ROI tremendously. Awesome. So the other thing you wanted to talk about was inside sales. So mm -hmm. I actually, when I was in B2B sales for a software company, this is some time ago, they were just starting their first inside sales department. And all the sales, we were like, what the heck is inside sales? Is this going to compete with us? And, mm -hmm. and obviously today it's become mainstream, but there might be some marketers that don't know what inside sales is. So why don't we start with, can you define sure. it? And then what should the role of that be in, in any company that might be listening? Yeah. Well, it, it's so ironic what you just said. My inside sale, like when I was doing the outside sales that we've talked about on this podcast, that channel was decimated and went away. Yeah. Because 15 of us spread out the country. We couldn't outsell Frankie, the worst inside sales rep. And he's in Vancouver. He ain't even never met a realtor. So the writing was on the wall for me. I just happened to be number one in outside sales. And if you're great, they'll figure out somewhere else to put you. But a lot of these guys were getting laid off each and every month. So inside sales, to answer your question, is it's basically a call center. It doesn't have to all be in one place now. It could be anywhere. But it is dialing for dollars. It's phone sales. It's telemarketing. It's outbound calling to inbound leads. And phone sales are different. Now, I think you have a lot of SaaS companies tuning in. Mm -hmm. And they're very blessed. They don't know it because the culture is this. Yeah, this is the culture. This ain't the culture at the in the mortgage industry. We ain't doing any face to face Zoom. There's no body language. There's no eye to eye, belly to belly. You know, face to face, and that's where realtors and a lot of these service industries shine. They shine in the room. They shine in the living room. They shine on the showing. They shine driving around to go to the next property because they know everything about the area. But they're not that good on the phone if you can't see them. And if you don't know them, so they're just so used to talking to people that they know that can see them. And now you got to talk to people that you don't know that don't see you. So things like scripts and questions and tone, and it's a whole nother beast. And th that's actually why I wrote the book. I was working with all these top real estate teams and we did a conference for them. And we just said, what do you want to learn? We gave them like a hundred topics to choose from. Lead conversion was the number one by far. It was like 2015, 2014. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, man, lead conversion. Now I know how to do that. <laughs> I just did that for 10 years. Like I didn't know they didn't know how to do that part. That's the easy part for me. That's the easy part because generating high quality leads is hard. Yeah. I think that's harder than being good at sales for, you know, woo, woo, for all my CMOs on the call. 
capturing high quality leads that are easy to convert, I believe is harder than being great at sales. And so what we're all just hoping for is to be great at both. So the inside sales is really part of this, this, I guess it could be part of that follow-up process that you talk about as well. What are you going to do for 30 days to keep them warm, mm -hmm. but also as its own, its own sort of, well, sales and marketing channel. So what, you know, yeah, you know, voicemails are audio ads, Neil, that's all they are. Mm. A voicemail is an audio ad, you know, and, and, and an email that doesn't get opened is an impression, a targeted impression too. Right. So yeah, like it, it goes all the way from the Super Bowl all the way down to the guy in the cubicle doing hand to hand combat. So would you encourage then every company you work with to implement inside sales? It's funny because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cold email seems to be very, very popular these days, as you know, like the robot in our so. inboxes, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, <right>? Exactly. <laughs> so what you're saying is why, you know, why aren't you doing cold phone calling? Why aren't you doing inside sales as well? Is that? Mm -hmm. Or is this yes only and no. to those, I or is am, this only referring to those leads that come in? Well, the the best is to do inbound marketing, outbound sales. But I'll be honest with you, if you've got a great product and you've, you know, can solve a real problem and you do sort of what I would call warm outreach, not that they know you, but that you should reach out and that you customize the reach out, it can work great. I know it's hard to scale that, but I don't know, man. I've just found that that, that marketing channel that's missing in many cases hmm. is the, the frontline worker. And yeah, inside sales is going to do a ton of stuff for us. They're going to call the leads. They're going to text the leads. They're going to leave voicemails. They're going to send the leads, your collateral that you love to create all those videos you paid for all those PDFs you had made. Who do you think is going to hand that to the person? Because you think they got it all off your website? No, we need a guide to show us how this all works. But in real estate, as one example, if you were to go to, let's say there's a website company in real estate and they want to sign up all the top realtors. Well, one path would be to build a bunch of funnels and build their brand and build content. And that's a great path. It just takes a while. Most people are not that patient. The other path would be Go on Zillow, put in the zip code that you want to sell them, see who the top agents are and reach out to them because of the top agents and say, Hey, Veronica, I'm reaching out to you because you sold 2,400 homes last year. After I call you, I'm going to call Jenny Weimer. My goal is to work with one of the two of you. And here's why hmm. I get so that really deal all day long. I don't need, she doesn't need to know me to, for me to get that meeting. So inside sales starts where marketing automation stops and it is the missing mm -hmm. piece that most organizations don't really have dialed in is. Oh, Neil, the beauty is when you can turn it off. Like, like I don't have a lot of email marketing automation because I write and send an amazing email every single week. Mm -hmm. So I got one or two up front cause you have to, cause they do so well, but I just let them go into the normal flow. Cause my normal stuff's great. So yeah automation is overrated. And the issue is that because you can, doesn't mean you should. Every company needs a kill switch. And the person you would actually use that kill switch on the, the most would be the best leads that were the most likely to convert. Because once sales identifies them, and typically the way we would advise that sort of turn off all communication, except for me, mm -hmm is when the salesperson manually changes the stage to hot. So I'm not changing it to hot unless something real good happened. And if something real good happened, and if I changed them to hot, the last thing I need is drip number 34 going out tomorrow. It happens so often. My, <laughs> I as know, you know, and it makes you look like a fool. Yeah. So yeah. that's actually something, uh, well, we work with a great CRM called Follow Up Boss. And that was one of the smartest things they did. And it was just because customers needed it. It was. Once they're marked contacted, it turns off all the campaigns. Mm. And then if you want to turn them back on, you can, you, you might contact them a week later. They say, Hey, we're still going to wait a year. Okay. Turn the campaigns back on. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's the problem with too much automation is you don't know, you don't even know who's going to get what email next up, you know, what mm -hmm. date. So, uh, well said. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you're just a treasure trove 
of of you know really really actionable information. I think uh, people listening had a lot to think about. And I will say, I have worked with real estate companies as well. But mm -hmm. you know, if you think of every real estate agent as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, that what what happens in that world is 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 one hundred percent applicable to any business. So I don't want mm -hmm. people listening to think you know, oh, that's just real estate. It, well, it's I would actually say it's harder than most because there's such a small percentage of the population that are actually needing your services anytime soon. You know, people don't buy and sell a home, but every seven to eight years. So it's right. like, what do you, what's your, what's your six year, 11 month marketing plan look like? That's why content marketing is so important in real estate. Talk about Because a if it's nothing cycle. but listings and solds and market reports, th they're going to tune out. And, and I'll leave you with this. 91% of people love their realtor. 9% of them use them the next time. Yeah. We all the know why gap. not. Yeah. Yep. It's a marketing yep. gap. Yep. So true. Well, Chris, thank you so much uh, for hopping on. I know that a lot of my audience probably want to reach out to you. Obviously, mm -hmm. the conversion code is wherever fine books are sold. We'll make sure we have mm -hmm. a link in the show notes. Where else can people find out, learn more about you, learn from you as well as your business? Yeah, thanks so much. Twitter and Instagram. That's my favorite two platforms. I'm on there all day, every day. It's me using 100% C-H-R-I-S underscore S-M-T-H. No I in Smith. When I got the account, Neil, I couldn't afford the vowel. <laughs> and Twitter post Elon Musk. I love okay. it. I, listen, I don't get caught up by who the bosses are. <laughs> that is such a slippery slope to try to figure out. Like, I, I think the thing that Elon did, and I, I wrote about this, that people are missing amongst the chaos is he just instilled overnight a culture of engineering and innovation. They are moving fast and they are breaking things and I love it. So I'm, I don't even really care about his personal hijinks. I think sometimes that clouds how good he is at executing and getting awesome engineering talent and making real changes that are, that actually matter. Like he's already made more changes that are awesome in like 90 days than they did in like nine years. So. I don't, and by the way, if we have to find someone, at least he's kind of in the middle, whether you're right or left, he kind of goes each way. He plays both sides of the fence. At least that, you know, at least it's not just purely Trump or purely Obama running the whole thing. That to me would be super divisive. So it's scary and it's new, but if I'm a brand, I'm just looking at the data Yep. and, and, and I don't think that you can pigeonhole a whole social network. You can't cancel culture, a social network. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought it was funny. And I don't, you know, whether I like Elon Musk or not, whether regardless of the political spectrum I'm on, I look at the data in my actual experience. I didn't see much of a difference. Everyone's like, oh, I'm going to Mastodon. I'm like, why would I change? What's different? And when things start to change, I'll, yeah. you know, I'll, but I haven't seen any changes myself. There's exactly. fewer people on, but I think I'm having <laughs> deeper conversations with the fewer people there and I'm finding newer people mm -hmm. coming on now. So, well, the best change he made was to just expose the views. Think how yeah. much more valuable Twitter feels because he's showing you impressions. I'm getting way more impressions on Facebook. They just don't show it to me unless I click a couple of times or it's kind of buried. So ju he just like cranked up the dopamine on day one by doing that. And you know what it did for me? Like hopefully a lot of people listening. Okay. People are seeing our stuff. Uh, also game on, how do I get this number up now? Right? Yep. So how do I improve mm -hmm. my content and, and what have you? So Amen. well, well said my friend. All right. All right, Neil. Well, thanks again, man. Thanks for having me on.